mystical and occult possibilities. My experience with this type of situation is that 99 out of 100 land in shipwreck before it's over. They might be able to handle the situation with some dignity if they were very wise or very poised or very well integrated. But who ever heard of an individual very poised and very well integrated who ever got mixed up in these things? Nine-tenths of the potential victims of their own foolishness in this direction are themselves neurotic. They are persons whose lives have been in one way or another, unhappy, frustrated, pressure-ridden. They are not thorough scholars. They are not deeply thoughtful individuals, trained thinkers. They are persons who have drifted along through the years, studying a little of this and a little of that, joining this organization and then that organization and most of them in trouble from the mere process of chronic joining. So many of these organizations threaten their members, that if the member leaves for any reason, some dark and mysterious curse will fall upon them. This is enough to wreck a life immediately. The individual living in the 20th century still has the old primordial instinct to be afraid of curses, and afraid of the evil thoughts of others. And the moment we give these evil thoughts a large place in our own thinking, we can begin to feel these thoughts moving in on us. Our lives can become haunted by the mere fears that arise from negative speculations about the unknown. These speculations didn't rise as the result of certain interest in metaphysical matters. Uh, the individual would probably immediately consider the possibility that he's mentally ill. But if um, this is part of some strange mystical procedure, he doesn't think of himself as ill at all. He thinks of himself as illuminated. He thinks of himself as having reached new dimensions of consciousness. But then these new dimensions of consciousness begin to go to work on him. And uh, before it's over, we realize that he has simply uh, used this strange unknown as a catalyst for his own neurosis. So we can't uh, too strongly recommend that persons be extremely cautious in trying to explore areas where their knowledge is simply insufficient. Now, knowledge in itself is a very good thing. We should know about everything, even things we do not really agree with, or even things we do not want to believe. We should know about them. We should never assume for a moment that ignorance is an asset. There is a great deal of difference, however, between understanding the theories and practices of certain beliefs and the effort to dabble with them ourselves. There is no reason why we shouldn't understand the theories behind transcendentalism if it intrigues us. But there are many reasons why we shouldn't dabble with it. Especially, this is true, where we actually haven't even any very solid groundwork in theory. It's one thing, perhaps, to make some modest experimentation after 20 years of careful study, in which we really have done our own study, not simply taken somebody else's word for it, read a few uh, ancient books or modern reprints. But to approach these things haphazardly, in a strange, childlike faith that somehow we are going to be protected from our own foolishness. Uh, this simply does not pay off, except in terms of tragedy. Now, one thing that's not too important at this stage of our thinking is whether uh, all this weird and wonderful world is a reality or simply a psychological condition within ourselves. 
Whether all this magic is a psychic phenomena or a psychological phenomena is not perhaps so important at this point. Regardless of which it is, it has the same effect on us. And uh, when we add to this a certain amount of coincidence, a certain amount of inevitable fortuity, we can build up a pretty strong case for things that can be very difficult if we're not careful. For example, we know that the average person who doesn't feel well will likely enough feel better tomorrow. A very large percentage of symptoms, as every doctor knows, are not very valid. That's one of the reasons why maybe a couple of aspirin tablets or something of that kind will permanently remove aggravating symptoms which have no real essential foundation uh, in a true bodily condition or warning, a little fatigue perhaps, a little eye strain, uh, a little tension, and we have a headache. We relax and the headache takes care of itself. It simply disappears. Now, in the same way... For hundreds of years, medicine made use of the bread pill and other simple formulas, the purpose of which was simply to cause the patient to believe that he had been given important medications and the patient, completely relieved of his anxiety, got well. He didn't really need any medication at all. This is also the reason why so many patent devices during the middle of the last century were so successful like the magnetic horse blanket and things of this nature. This magnetic blanket had absolutely no magnetism whatever associated with it, but thousands of people reported amazing and miraculous cures. Uh, they also announced tremendous results from various uh, herb concoctions and swamp root preparations, the only medicinal element being alcohol. But naturally, it gave a certain note of encouragement, especially if the doses were large and frequent. <laughs> the individual, therefore, if uh, left to his own devices, will very often feel better, at least temporarily. But if an individual who has nothing wrong with him, except perhaps a little anxiety mechanism, uh, feels that he is being treated for this, uh, that uh, some other person is sending him powerful vibrations, he gets feeling better very quickly, just like he used to get feeling better on Peruna. It was, uh, there was a certain parallel here. And we come finally to really believe that people are doing a lot of these things for us or to us when we're really doing them to or for ourselves. But coincidence also comes in, plays quite a part in some of these things. I've seen it. And in a little while, we come to the conclusion that thoughts are very, very vital things, that we only have to send a few thoughts around, and the whole face of common sense is altered. This goes on for a time. What ends up, what ends is finally the individual becomes seriously ill with something and perhaps by neglecting it in the hope of some other form of magical cure reaches a point where he cannot be saved at all. These things have their mysterious negative factors that we have to watch for constantly. Because faith is a wonderful thing, but when it's put in the wrong place and the wrong things are believed in, it can be very costly in terms of health and happiness and life. One of the simplest uh, examples of what might be termed magic uh, that man has used from the very earliest time is prayer. Now, prayer can be a very wonderful thing for the human being. It has a tremendous potential for good. And yet so few of us can use prayer unselfishly. It is so hard for us to, to really be sincere even in this, if we really believe that prayer is a power, then this power becomes the basis of a temptation of some nature. Power promises us things. 
And it's very hard to believe in power without trying to use it uh, to our own advantage or to the 